Morning, everyone. Morning, everyone. Morning, everyone. Uh, titled towards uh, trustworthy uh, digital ecosystem. In this thesis, we have uh, two parts basically. Uh, we'll be focusing on the dual aspects of uh, enhancing fairness in algorithmic systems and also detecting fraudulent activities on digital platforms. First, I'll get started with how social networks have revolutionized uh, our community. So, yeah, let's start by looking at the profound impact social networks have had uh, in our daily lives. They have not only revolutionized interpersonal communications, but also reshaped the landscape of information propagation online uh, through various platforms like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and whatnot. Um, often anybody in the world is not more than a few clicks away or a few hops away. This hyper connectivity has made it possible for uh, movements, political movements to gain momentum for small businesses to reach global markets and for information to spread at unprecedented speed. Uh, it has also democratized access to information, learning opportunities, and entertainment. This hyper connectivity, however, does come with a cost. This hyper connectivity has made it possible for uh, users to exploit other users by employing fraudulent and deceptive mechanisms. Uh, the same tools that help spread democracy and information and friendship over the internet can be used to manipulate public opinion, spread information, and perpetuate scams. Moreover, the algorithm, algorithms that are used to drive this content to the users also carry some inherent biases due to their architecture and the data they trained on. So in this thesis, I'll be looking at two specific aspects. One is fixing the tendency of algorithmic systems to produce biased outputs. And the other part is uh, detecting deceptive design practices and uh, identification of group of fraudulent users in Google Play Store. So the first part uh, is covered by a book called Caffin, and the second one is called Erasing Labor with Labor. This is a quick overview on what to expect. So first I'll be covering Caffin, uh, and this is basically the flow. Uh, next, I'll be covering, once that's done, I'll be moving on to my second work, Erasing Labor with Labor. Getting started with Caffin, I'll first like to... Yeah, so... First, I'd uh, like to thank my collaborators uh, who have worked on me in this work. I'll now move on to the primary motivation on, on our, of our work and what we end up doing for that. I'll get started with what graph neural networks are. So graph neural networks are part of a wider field of geometric deep learning, which focuses on learning from uh, geometrically structured data. Um, mostly, the most common way to uh, go about this is uh, through message passing, uh, where messages are passed between nodes to uh, improve their representations. In this work, we'll focus on unsupervised GNN. For unsupervised GNNs, the input is a graph, and the, the input is a graph where each node or an edge has primitive features, primitive rep uh, representations, and the output is the same graph with refined representations after message passing or some uh, other form of uh, learning. So, yeah, with this in mind, I'll move on to the motivation for our work. So recent studies have shown that uh, GCNs, besides, uh, despite their expressive, strong expressive power and versatility, uh, favor nodes with uh, high degree. Uh, this can be seen on the figure on the left. So this is uh, the values noted after training. So if you can see the average accuracy on the downstream task is proportional to the degree of the node and the average loss occurred after training, this is after training, uh, it is inversely proportional to the which essentially means that DCNs tend to learn better uh, for uh, nodes with higher degree, and this is exactly what uh, we'll be focusing on in this work. We just uh, want to make this disparity uh, slightly lower. Um, moving on, so the figures that you see here, the x-axis is basically the degree and the y-axis is accuracy. So this is kind of a proxy metric. The slope in this figure is kind of a proxy metric for how fair a system is. So the lower the slope, uh, more fair the system is. That is, it is treating nodes of various degrees. So once we employ, uh, employ Caffin on grassage, we can see a reduction of 20% in the slope. So this is a uh, way and a superficial way to uh, show that Caffin indeed makes it fair. 
So I'll now move on to why do we care about this uh, form of fairness? First, uh, first reason being that in many real world applications, the nodes in the graph in, uh, represent entities uh, that uh, that deserve equitable treatment, like users in a social network or items in a recommendation system, let's say. So from a pure fairness perspective, um, ensuring that the performance of DNNs balances uh, balances between various uh, degrees means that no group of entities would be preferred over the other group of entities from a pure, pure fairness perspective. There are also other reasons why one would uh, want uh, balanced performance between degree of nodes. The second reason being the generalizability. So models train predominantly where uh, on social networks and other networks uh, where um, high degree nodes dominate. Um, they tend to learn the distribution as it is. And when when you move to an out of out of distribution graph, let's say that the uh, distribution of degree is much more normalized, uh, they tend to underperform. So learning good representations for both the low degree and high degree nodes would ensure that it is much more generalizable as well. So one other thing, uh, one other advantage from a adversarial robustness perspective is that distributing importance, learning importance ensures that model strain are robust to adversarial attacks. In the very, at least in the very least case, it increases the cost for the attacker. Basically, what they tend to do is if a node, if a low degree node does not learn well, it's much easier for them to attack it. But we ensure that it's uh, equitable. Uh, they have the attacker has to increase increase their cost to accommodate and attack more nodes. Actually, and there are also certain applications which inherently rely on representation of less popular or less central nodes. One of them being anomaly detection, where you where your focus is much more on the low degree nodes than the high degree nodes because they are much more interesting to you than the others. Another one is rare node prediction, uh, node property prediction. So this is predominantly seen in biomedical field, uh, usually in uh, disease interaction graphs where you need to prioritize diseases uh, which do not have much uh, as much interaction as the other equally, if not more than popular diseases, let's say. So with the Motivations in solidified. I'll now move on to our strong, uh, formal problem statement. So our problem statement is to modify generic contrastive based unsupervised GNNs to reduce the performance disparity between the highly central and less central nodes in an inductive setting. So we formulated as a group group fairness problem where we have two groups. We name them popular and unpopular. Popular group contains nodes with high degree and unpopular uh, contains the other set of nodes. And uh, we tested on two downstream tasks, not classification and link prediction. Uh, I'll now give a brief overview of the pipeline on how CAFRI works. So if you see the flowchart on the left, what GraphSage does, GraphSage and most other frameworks do is prioritize the information flow equally amongst both of these combination graphs. So the combination graph for node six and node two, as you can visibly see, Node six is node six has a much richer combination graph, and the information flow is equally prioritized. So this will lead to uh, node six uh, having more access to information, uh, act, having larger access to information just because it has abundant neighborhoods, and this would reflect in the downstream task accuracy as well because the representations are well learned for node six when compared to node two. What Caffin superficially does. Is it prioritizes information flow in smaller combination graphs uh, uh, when compared to uh, larger combination graphs? So the arrows that you see there, you see uh, three arrows in node two combination graphs and one arrow in node six, which means that the information is prioritized uh, much larger. The information flowing through the combination graph of node two is prioritized more than what is flowing through node six. So in the hopes that the final representations that you uh, get are equally uh, rich, and this is also shown in the this is also observed in the downstream accuracy as well. So the way in which we achieve this is by modifying the loss function. So I'll now move on to first establishing what GraphSage's loss function is. Then I'll go on to our modification. So this is GraphSage loss function. 
it has two main parts the first part so not a couple of notations here node u is the nodal focus node v is its positive sample node vn is its negative sample so what the first term tries to do is it tries to push the embedding of node u and v together and the second term pretty much does the opposite it tries to push away the uh, node in focus and its negative sample further away from each other in the hopes that the embedding space is as representative as the input graph. So we take these notions, we do not change them. We just add, uh, make slight modifications and add secondary objectives in our loss function. Uh, I'll now, this is Cassin's loss function essentially. Now I'll go into the specific parts. The first term that you see here is uh, degree normalization. Uh, so if you remember in the very first slide, I showed you how degree is inversely proportional uh, to the degree. Uh, the, the loss is inversely proportional to the degree. So here we penalize this central mode, or uh, nodes mode, uh, basically to ensure that if the gradient descent has to choose between optimizing on a less central node or a more central node, it would much rather optimize on a less central node because the decrease, the scope for decrease the contribution to the final total loss is much higher. So that's the motivation for the first term. Yeah, and the second term, what we essentially do is we take the uh, objectives of initial uh, graph stage, the, the essentially making the embedding space as representative as the input space, and we make it, uh, we make, uh, we formulate it in, slight, in a slightly different way. What we do here is, uh, we take the ratio of the uh, distances in the embedding space and the distance in the geodesic space and force them to be uh, uh, in a particular ratio for it to give minimal loss. So the so essentially the motivation is that the distances in the embedding space should be representative as the distances in the geodesic space. We offer one degree of freedom here for the user to train upon. So the K that you see in the denominator of the first term is a hyperparameter. So this is something we need to leave it up to the users to tune it on uh, to make sure that it works well for this setting. So yeah, we take a ratio between the embedding space distance and a geodesic space distance and force, force it to be a particular value. And finally, we just pass, uh, pass the distance ratio to a loss landscape motioning function just to ensure that uh, whatever you get inside is first differentiable, continuous everywhere, and also it almost equally penalizes both sides of the ratio, like less than one and greater than one. Log does it well to some extent. Uh, log square does it well to some extent, so we stick with log square. And we do the proposed modification for both the positive sample and the negative sample. If you see here, there's only one node in focus, uh, D, D, uh, basically, yeah, just D, D here. Uh, we do not have a negative sample, so we repeat the same procedure for negative sample. So this would just be replaced by again, the positive sum and add, a, add them up to begin. Now, uh, yeah, I'll move on to how we measure the improvement in sadness. So that's this famous metric called statistical parity or imparity, and uh, we stick with it. For node classification, we use Jian Kang's definition, and we just reformulate only one thing here. That is how we define the weights. Uh, basically, the motivation here is that you take the sum of accuracy differences between classes across groups. So A1, C here would mean that one here is the group of popular nodes, two here is the group of unpopular nodes, C here is the specific class. So let's say in the downstream task in the given graph, let's say you have six classes, uh, then you would compare it across classes. And we also weight it and we weight it proportional to the class size. So the motivation here is that smaller uh, samples should not skew the metric as much as uh, larger representative samples. For link prediction, uh, if you look at it, we will have three types of edges. One is between a popular node and a popular node, which is PP. One is between a popular node and an unpopular node, PUP, and UPUP, uh, which is between an unpopular node and an unpopular node. Uh, we stick to something purely statistical here. So we stick to standard deviation because it is minimized when the performance observed across all these three category of edges uh, is as close to their mean as possible. So this is a very simple way, uh, very simple motivation uh, to go with it. Uh, so with imparity defined, I'll now move on to the metrics that we actually showcase in our paper. 
first is the improvement in imparity. So lower the imparity, the better. So I think that you see there uh, is the baseline uh, imparity and I here is after applying capital. So you basically measure the reduction percentage reduction in square And we also measure the consistency of the results because it is shown, it is known that the GNNs are better than stochastic grass age in particular is stochastic because it does random sampling. We want to ensure that uh, it does not vary a lot. We want to essentially solidify results. So the first two metrics measure the improvement and its consistency in fairness. The next two measures, uh, next two metrics measure the cost of fairness. Uh, as with anything, uh, applying a second objective in this case, fairness almost almost always comes with a cost. In our case, the cost is twofold. Uh, one is the drop in accuracy because you had a second you had a secondary objective, which means that it deviates from its initial objective of maximizing accuracy. So that's a slight drop drop in accuracy, just what we measured by CA. And uh, if you had noticed before, um, yeah, if you had noticed before, we have pairwise distances between each node, and this is not trivial to compute. So that is some pre-processing cost involved as well. And we also need to compute the degree of each of the nodes. So that is at least of. So we also measure the time overhead per increase in imparity, which is basically like how much time you are spending uh, in seconds for an unit increase in imparity that you see. So yeah, these two are the cost of fairness. I'll now move on to the data sets. So we have six data sets from diverse domains. We want Kaplan's formulation to be as domain agnostic as possible. So we have two citation network, one social network, two uh, co-purchase network. In this case, it's Amazon co-purchase networks and one biological network. It's a protein protein interaction network. We also have data sets uh, ranging from various sizes from like 10K nodes to a million nodes. And we also tested on um, multiple uh, multi label classification as well. I'll now uh, jump to the results. So, uh, for both link prediction and node classification, you see a uh, very good improvement in, in parity. In link prediction, it's an average of 45.5%, and node classification is 42.2%. The CB is also in an acceptable range. It's not like uh, very high that you need to be concerned about. Uh, the stochasticity, and if you look at the costs, they are uh, they are pretty much well in control as well. So in, on average, you lose 2.6 percent accuracy for link prediction and 3.9 percent, which is acceptable because um, GNNs now in the state that they are, they perform in like 85, uh, 90s ranges. So uh, the accuracy of 2.6 percent is justifiable for a 45.5 percent decent uh, fairness. And the cost, the time that you see here, uh, is also, uh, also seems to be quite scalable. In the worst case, you seem to be spending eight seconds per unit increase in the time. So I'll now move on to the ablation studies. So if you remember earlier, I said Kaplan actually modified term for both the positive sample and the negative sample. So we have two more versions of Kaplan, Kaplan P and Kaplan N, which actually modified term only for the positive sample and the negative sample, uh, respectively. And we also propose a, a newer version, a better version of Kaplan called Kaplan AD, which whose main goal is to reduce this time uh, complexity in use. So Kaplan AD uses landmark distances instead of the actual node distances to bring down the complexity from uh, V square plus V to uh, VL, where L is the number of landmarks. So the main goal of Kaplan AD is to make it faster while not compromising too much on the performance. Moving on to the results of aberration studies, we see that Kaplan N and Kaplan, Kaplan P don't really outperform Kaplan, so that's essentially no motivation to uh, work with them. Kaplan AD, we see a massive reduction in that metric P, and it also fares well in most cases, so it's a realistic alternative for Kaplan in case of large graphs. And for the particular data set PPI, you see a 1878x time speed up. Uh, in the time it takes to complete. So, last couple of ablation studies. So, we also tested uh, again as DNNs are stochastic. We also tested stability across popular feeds. So, we collect the popular seeds uh, from Van B. Van B is 2022 report. We have the popular, most popular feeds logged on the platform. Uh, so, we run Kaplan uh, 
uh, across all these seats and see that, uh, yeah, the average performance is stable. And, uh, and we also statistically established that the distribution shift and the results that we showed earlier are statistically significant. We run a t test and see that the p values for the distribution shift between caffeine and and caffeine, caffeine P and caffeine is significant. And so our results are can be taken as well. values. So this pretty much concludes our first work. There are a couple of more ablation studies with the thesis document if you are interested. I'll now uh, move on to our second work. Uh, it is in favor with paper. Again, I'd like to thank my collaborators, but just like it is and so So yeah, there are these very specific apps in the Google Play Store called uh, that we name installing the incentivizing app, IIA, IIA henceforth. So what these apps do here, like you can see, is uh, they pay you a certain amount for you to uh, download and install a certain game. So this essentially promotes users a mod, uh, promotes users to download and rate apps which they wouldn't have otherwise. So the motivation behind doing this is that apps that are promoted by IAAs are two x more like uh, likely to appear in the top chart and six x more likely to witness an increase in their installs. So the motivation of the developers have plenty of motivation to subscribe to one of these IAAs to promote their apps. The interesting thing is that it explicitly goes against Google Play Store's policy. So this is a screenshot from Google Play Store's web page themselves. So developers must not attempt to manipulate the placement of any apps on Google Play. The specific line goes against the very uh, notion of these apps. So in the study, our goal is to study these apps in detail and see how they also affect, not only affect the platform, but also affect the users. So, uh, we start with collecting our data set. So to converge on an initial set, uh, we use various popular metrics like the ratio of five star ratio to one star ratio and a couple of other metrics to uh, converge on a seed set. Once we have the seed set, we manually go through them and select 60 apps. And 85% of these apps have more than 100k installs and the installs across all these apps amount to 160. So the impact and the reach that these apps have is not trivial. It's in many types and hundreds of millions. So it just further motivates us to study more. And uh, we take a two-pronged approach in our work. We do both qualitative analysis and quantitative analysis. For the qualitative analysis, we only collect the most relevant reviews. Relevant reviews are the ones that you see directly on the apps page without looking so more. So the, note, the idea behind just collecting the relevant reviews for qualitative analysis is that this is what the users in face value of an app. So we collected for a period of one month, which amounts to around 2k reviews uh, with almost uh, almost that many unique reviewers. For quantitative analysis, we create a much larger data set. We create all the reviews that these apps have uh, incurred for, uh, for, the, for a period of five months. This results in 320 reviews, which has 301k unique reviews. So, yeah, you see a uh, app interaction graphs that you see there. Essentially, each node is an app, and the edge rate is proportional to the amount of reviewers they have in common. So, you see the pretty things with that. Uh, moving on to the qualitative analysis. Uh, so, we take the list of all the relevant reviews. And then we do open inductive coding. We ensure consensus and uh, inter annotated inter annotated agreement on every step uh, every step of the pipeline. And we also define label uh, as it's defined uh, in the Cambridge dictionary. So and we first convert on the high level codes. So we see that the reviews talk about exploitation, UI challenges, satisfaction, anything that is positive, and also promotion for the app itself. With these high level ports in place, we do line by load, uh, line by line coding to move on to low level ports. From the low level ports, we detect dark patterns and fraud evidence, which I'll come to now. So we observe nine kinds of dark patterns, a couple of them that are interesting. I would, I'll just go over a couple of them that are interesting. One is progress manipulation. So basically, uh, most of these apps do not explicitly give you monitoring rewards, instead, they give you snap points. So if you download this app, I give you 10 points. 
and using this endpoint, you can convert it to link pain using later on. So what they do is uh, at the initial stages, they keep paying you off as and then. But once you start uh, accumulating more uh, more points, let's say let's say over hundred, uh, they will reset your bar to zero without without your consent. So there is progress manipulation as well. And uh, another thing is cannot redeem as withdrawal limit. So people keep up accumulating this point, but there is no way for them to redeem it back. So they basically cut out the redeeming feature, essentially rendering their uh, labor going to waste. The second thing is we observe some kind of evidence, uh, evidence for fraud as well. So if you see the uh, review on the very right, they asked you to rate it five stars and promise to give you 100 points, but give nothing. So yeah, root users are being exploited in this regard as well. I will now move on to the quantitative analysis. We start out with permissions. So 95% um, of the apps compromise dangerous permission. Uh, here, uh, the danger, the dangerousness of a permission is defined by Android developers, Android themselves, and we do not define it. So 92% of these apps access sensitive user information, uh, which is uh, very suspicious given that they are a simple platform which just rewards users for uh, what they're doing. They, for example, 14 of the apps uh, ask permission to take pictures and videos. You won't be able to redeem your coins un until you give uh, the permissions, uh, until you give the permit, until the user gives the permission. And uh, what is uh, um, even more suspicious is that two of these apps, uh, for some reason, need to read your contacts as well. Modify your calendar, email, uh, even send emails, create accounts, set passwords. So users are being exploited on multiple fronts. One is that they are being exploited because what they see on the actual Play Store is itself manipulated because there are these hidden apps which promote users to download other apps so that they appear on the Play Store. And on the other side, there are also the users who do that are also being exploited by not being paid for what they're owed and uh, yeah, basically, privacy is also quite Moving on, uh, we, we go on to study lockstep behavior. So the goal is to detect burst of reviews on an app within a short period of time. For this, we create a, a reviewer app interaction graph. It's basically a bipartite graph where one set of interests are the apps and the other set of and the other set are reviewers. The H and H here would denote a reviewer reviewing an app. So each edge carries a value. Uh, that value is basically what they rate the app. So we have a temporal uh, edge list of sorts. Uh, just a spoiler, yeah, this edge list as a text type uh, is around 50 bits. So it's a pretty big uh, edge list. So we had to, to achieve our goal, we have to do something very efficient. So that is just very, uh, and before going into the method, there are two types of extremes here. Uh, we name them eBoost and eSync. eBoost are it's uh, eBoost are edges where the rate uh, where the rating associated with that edge is greater than the average rating of the app, and with the other ways that the rating associated with the edge is less than the average rating. And we move on to uh, the an 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 popular anomaly detection method called Midas. It's by Siddharth Bajaj and his team at NAS. So what my Midas works on a streaming hypothesis. So what it essentially does is it tries to build an internal representation of the distribution of the incoming edges. So based on the previous timestamps, it it tries to make a prediction on what is the what is the number of edges to be expected between certain entities, uh, certain two entities in a graph. And if it if it is um, too far, too high, or too less from that expectation. It's given a high anomaly score. So the anomaly scores basically proportional to the deviations from the expected number of edges between two entities. So we take this, we modify modify it slightly to work better for the bipartite setting. Uh, basically, we hard code certain stuff to make it faster because we know that our graph is bipartite. And um, running it, we observe that uh, the boosting edges are much more anomalous in general than sinking edges. And we also see uh, uh, physical, uh, we also manually look through some of the clusters detected by them and a very small cluster that we wanted to fit in this diagram for our representation purpose. You see R1, R2, R3 reviewers acting at the in the very same uh, timestamp 
they review the uh, review both the app cache and app store together. So this is what we mean by lockstep behavior. So essentially, what lockstep behavior almost always corresponds to is bot forming of reviews. So uh, yeah, so the takeaway from these two diagrams is that we see that bot forms are better used to boost reviews than simply. And finally, we move on to the semantics of the reviews themselves. Since we have a lot of reviews, we uh, pass them through a sentence word encoder. And uh, something really, really interesting that we observe uh, is that there are identical paths of that is the same with great app, great app, great app, great app, just with a couple of modifications to, uh, yeah, the spending, uh, not the spending, but the spaces between great and app and so on. For some reason, they thought that was a good idea. And uh, basically, once we encode and look at this cosine similarity, we find that more than 35% of the reviews are exactly the same. And uh, there are these clusters as well. 47 clusters contain uh, highly identical review pairs in reboot, and in sync, more than 10% of the reviews form highly identical pairs. Um, yeah, so this basically concludes our work. Our main takeaway from this work is that users are not only exploited because what they see in the actual top charts of, are of Play Store is actually manipulated, but also the users who contribute to that manipulation are being manipulated as well. So that's manipulation going on both sides of the point. Um, in this thesis, we have covered uh, two aspects. Uh, one is addressing the algorithm with bias in use uh, in uh, DCNs, and the other one is looking at the exploitation of users on the Google Play Store. Um, in, basically, we, we are taking in the step, uh, we are taking a step in the direction of making online systems safe for users to be in and also fair for users to uh, interact with. Uh, obviously, there is much more scope to do uh, well. Um, in Kafin, we only look at one form of bias, the bias in Induced due to degree of centrality. There are other biases that are carried by neural networks as well. Many uh, biases are tied to the architecture of the models themselves. So that could be something that that could be that should be explored in the future. And uh, in our second work, we just look at one specific platform. I'm pretty sure several uh, several other platforms have similar behavior as well. So the future work is to uh, address. Uh, such problems with it and address such problems on our platforms. So the first work that you saw happen uh, was an oral at DCAI, and the second work uh, was published at DCM Hypertext. Uh, before concluding, I, I would like to take a moment to uh, acknowledge a few people. First, uh, Professor PK for, for his constant guidance. Uh, my wonderful collaborators, Dr. Ramasuri Narayana, uh, Professor Polo uh, Professor Jason An, for being uh, really supportive throughout the process. Uh, Peacock, Peacock family for uh, everything, I would say, and for my time at the lab, my co-authors for their time and commitment, and also fun times, uh, my friends and parents for everything. And that concludes the work. Thank you. I will stop the recording. <laughs>